begin with. Uh, I need a motion to adopt the agenda as written. Is there a motion? Walter seconds it. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. That motion carries 6 0. All right, that carries us to 3.1, the Benjamin D. Trago Award for Strategic Leadership in Education. Dr. Catherine Blackburn, if you'll come forward. Speaker on Shall I sit or stand? You can do whatever you okay. wish. If everyone else is sitting, maybe I'll do that too. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here tonight. So I'm very proud to be able to recognize uh, the Cabarrus County School District for the Benjamin B. Trigo uh, Award for Strategic Leadership in Education. Uh, Dr. Trigo was the fa is the founder of Trigo Ed, and he founded an industry uh, around teaching people problem solving and decision making strategies. So tens of millions of people throughout the world have effectively used these tools in business, industry, and government, and now in education. Um, and Dr. Trigo uh, believed, he was a man who believed in the power of people, that uh, when people work effectively together, they can accomplish important and exciting things. He was committed to helping people think more effectively and to, to uh, optimize that technology that's on top of our shoulders. And he also believed that if something is important enough, if it's really worth doing, then we need to risk not doing it perfectly. So this award that I'm getting ready to present honors school districts across the country, three, three different school districts, uh, who embody these same beliefs and who have demonstrated uh, a commitment to collaborative problem solving and decision making and strategic leadership. So we're honored to uh, award uh, the Cabarrus County School District, uh, Dr. Christopher Lauder and his leadership team with this award, but I want to say a few things about why, how they, why they deserved it. They have consistently demonstrated a commitment to the community and to stakeholders by ensuring that they have a voice. They have made decisions that are aligned with district priorities and driven by data. They have consistently been committed to building the capabilities of leaders, that would be school, district, classroom leaders, and other staff. They have built transparency and trust through using systematic approaches uh, for handling tough situations in the district. And they've had the courage to make decisions that may not have been popular, but were ones that were for the benefit of students. And so at this time, I'd like to present a trophy to Dr. Christopher Lauder and to the Cabarrus County School District uh, for the Benjamin B. Trigo Strategic Leadership in Education. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'd also, okay, one more time. Here we go. I'm, I'm kind of quick, so congratulations, Chris. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'd also like to uh, provide frame certificates to Dr. Lauder, because you, you may not know, but for a while he was actually training people, training leaders. And um, he didn't do that as a superintendent, but as an assistant superintendent. And really, that, that says a lot about the commitment of the district. So, Chris, thank you so much for your thank leadership. You, you. And I'd like to recognize two very special people that were on the leadership team. Uh, that helped, you know, contribute to this award. One is Dr. Cheryl Milam, who has come back from retirement today to get this award. So, Cheryl. Do you want a separate picture? Okay, all right. So, <laughs> there we go. And then also to Amy Louder, who's, who has been now the continuing person doing the training and a lot of facilitating. So, Amy. Congratulations. There we go. And then we're going to get one last picture of everybody, if that's okay. Yes. I feel very <laughs> short. I feel like this, like midget, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, sir. I just want to say one thing real quickly. How much we appreciate Kathy Blackburn, Dr. Blackburn, um, working with us and, and kind of um, initiating us to this process. And then, as she mentioned, um, Amy Louder and Dr. Milam. Dr. Milam's retired now, but they really kind of picked up the ball. And Amy still carries that ball and really is our leader here for teaching people and to continue that. So she's a, she's a big part of that. Both of them were a big part of it. And it's a tribute to... Um, uh, Kelly Klutz, our chief financial officer, who's embraced that process and, and made it part of our budget process in particular, and really our school board here too, which when, we, when you were, guys were introduced to that, um, we, what you find out is that most districts don't have a process for their budget, and we have a really strong one. And so um, we appreciate um, Dr. Blackburn bringing that to us and people keeping it on and you guys around the table for, for using that because I think it really helps us. and. Um, has helped us in the process over the years in this past year. I think some of the decisions that our county commissioners made are because we, we do have a process and we've invited that into it. So it really does help our district. And I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been a part of that because it makes a big difference for us. But thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Ladder. All right, Dick takes us to item number four. That is the budget amendments, and Ms. Klutz is going to come up. Good evening. Uh, before you, you have uh, three budget amendments. We'll start with the state budget amendment. Um, most of these items are additions to the, the state budget, and those were items that we were expecting. Um, you can see uh, the first one is a significant allotment to our uh, computer equipment that we received from the state. The next one is uh, the after-school quality grant we were expecting. Um, the next one is the M-Class Reading 3D, and those replaces, the, the funding for this replaces the iPads for the, uh, the lower grades. Ooh, whoa. it's going fast. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so we'll move on to our second budget amendment, the federal funds. Just a little bit. And... We have a couple of reclass um, items there, and you'll also see where um, we're just now getting like the McKinney-Vento funds, and that's just the normal process of the federal budgets, and so you can see um, that those allotments there. We'll go on to our capital. Yes, Can, can I just ask a question sure. on that McKinney-Vento funds? Mm -hmm. It says pupil transportation $3,000. I know we spend much, <laughs> much, much, much more than that. Good catch. Um, so what, it, what is this? The grant is not designed to, to take care of 100% of the costs that we incur, but if there's anything that we can put toward it, we will. Um, and so that's basically what we have left to go toward a very large transportation bill associated with McKinty Bento. And John Basilis is in the back. I just, if he had anything, you're good. because it's not really intended for transportation. Okay, so the next one is our capital outlay budget amendment. Um, and you'll see at the top, we're allocating funds to the Mount Pleasant Middle School replacement. And the county didn't do just one allocation. They're doing allocations as we need the money um, and as they get the money. So um, that you can see that's for furniture and technology for that school. Um, you can also see the $306,000 that we talked to the board about a couple of times recently to get started on the architecture for the uh, new high school. Um, the R. Brown McAllister, uh, the board also approved that recently. And then um, we're just now uh, booking the land acquisition funds because the county um, acquires them through the county and then we just book it, put it on our books. Are there any questions on those budget amendments? All right, board members, based on the presentation, do we want to put this on the consent agenda for next week? Okay. All Thank right. You. Consent agenda. That moves us on to 4.2. Um, that is the approval of policy revisions and the PLS updates on the first reading. 
Ms. Reimer is here. Good evening. We have 11 policies tonight up for first read consent. <coughs> Uh, the first policy is policy 4303, which is fair and consistent discipline. This is an optional new policy designed to assist the board in proactively addressing disproportionality in discipline. We have a new policy in 8305. It's federal grant administration. This is a new policy recommended to establish board expectations for the administration of federal grants. We have policy 4100, 4110, and 4125, all that uh, deal with uh, changes to ESSA. 4100 is uh, a policy that requires uh, requirements to address the school's obligation to enroll students that are in foster care and revises existing language regarding students who are homeless. It also updates the legal reference. 4110 adds new section D to require the immediate enrollment of children in foster care who lack documentation of immunization or health ass assessments. Updates legal references. 4125. Homeless students updates the policy to comply with the changes to McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistant Act and guidance issued by the U.S. Department of Education. Updates legal re references and cross-references. Changes a word from shall to will. And then changes his or her to the students in the first sentence. Policy 6420, contracts with the board. PLS recommended change. Clarifies the approval for construction contracts is governed by policy 9120. <clears throat> Distinguished ordinary contract amendments from construction contract change orders as a requirement for reports to the board of all contracts and contract amendments that exceed the threshold amount that is already set by the board. And in section D adds a list of principal board policies that contain contracting requirements. Policy 7635 is a return to work, clarifies that the obligations to assist employees to find suitable employment is limited to the available positions within the school system and clarifies that the policy does not require the superintendent to create a position for an employee who is unable to perform the essential functions of his or her previous position and makes other minor revisions for further clarity. Policy 7810, evaluation of licensed employees, adds requirement regarding evaluations of licensed personnel in low-performing schools to address the new State Board of Education policy requirement. Policy 9030, facil facility construction, adds new information in Section B pertaining to change orders for construction contracts, specifies a threshold amount of for change orders that determines where the board approval is required, as required by statute, specifies a process for submitting change orders to contracts that are in excess of $300,000 and updates cross-references. Policy 9120, bidding for construction work. Section E modifies requirements for contracts to go to the board by establishing by a dollar threshold for board approval to be consistent with the approach used in Policy 6420 for other types of contracts. And Section F adds a requirement for reports to the Board of All Construction and Repair Contracts approved by the superintendent that exceed a threshold amount set by the board. And Policy 9130, Supervision of Construction Contracts, adds a provision noting that the change order for construction contracts are to be managed in accordance with Policy 9030, Facility Construction, deletes requirement that a consultant service contracts be approved by the board in every case since these contracts would be subject to the approval requirements of Policy 6420, contracts with the board, and updates the cross-references. Are there any questions on any of these policies, Mr. Walter? So these are on our website for people to review and comment? Yes, sir. We, we added those today. Okay. Um, the one was the discipline. The first one was is in that regarding suspensions. Is that what the... It's, it's a comprehensive discipline report. If you read the entire policy, it, uh, we typically send something to, to the state or we have to send something into the year. It also gives the board um, the right to ask for more than that report requires. So we don't currently have an issue with disproportionality? Or do, no. Okay. And then I guess the other question is, if I recall in the policy meeting, didn't we have some policy that you were going to review to see if it was consistent with our practices? Yes. Is it? I didn't hear back from that. We pulled it. It's on the agenda for next month. It's not on this. It's not in this batch of policies. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, uh, Mr. Harrison. Could we look, um, please, at the PDF for ninety thirty nine zero three zero? Um, in section B, third paragraph and fourth paragraph down, um, do we have any thoughts on what amounts 
would go into those um, blocks right there. It should be ninety thousand. It is on, the, on that dot. It should be ninety thousand, which I think is consistent with our other policies, in both of those. So that will be added to. <clears throat> Are there any other material changes um, in this particular policy that warrant further discussion? Not according to the policy committee. It's so those edits will be made? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any other comments or questions for Ms. Reimer? Uh, Mr. I, I, Mr. I, Dr. I, Phillips, please. It goes, goes back to the, the first one, uh, 4303. So it, th there's a number of different reports that it says are supposed to be generated for the board. Um, is this going to create a lot of extra work, or are these reports that you're, you're already generating for uh, the state, perhaps, or someone else? Every year we generate it at the end of the school year for uh, our accountability department. Matthew Feld does a lot of that work for us. Ms. Burns works on that as well, and so we submit that to the state. Uh, this policy does give the board the opportunity to ask for something other than that report. Uh, a lot of times we do a lot of that work previously as well, just for our own, own good. So we don't see it as something that will cause a lot more work. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I, I would think it would be one of those things where as long as we are uh, have numbers that, that don't raise eyebrows, we would just say, looks good. And if there is a trend that we're seeing that we don't like, then we might ask for more detail. There's also a state report that comes out in, is that January, that pretty much has suspensions. It, it's a state report that compares to all other districts, and that's usually the one that we use and kind of send to you guys as the board, and then you know how you compare with other districts, and that I think it comes out in January. It's either January or February. Thank you. And, and if I may, I mean, uh, it, I'm hearing you say that the reporting will not be sub, sub, substantively different but uh, will the rate reports and the data in the reports be used in a more, um, in, a, in a different way at all going forward? If, if the accumulation of the report is not um, much different than what we have been doing in the past, I understand that. But what will we do with the data differently going forward? I, I think to Dr. Phillips' point is we'll evaluate the data and, and once we evaluate the data, we may do a lot of different stuff according to what the data says each year so I guess um, any board member um, would like some heads up and some advance notice about how the data is looking and what needs to uh, proposals about how to um, uh, review the data as it's um, accumulated if we're going to begin paying more attention to it in 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 a more meticulous way or a different way. Um, I'd like to suggest that the board ought to have some heads up about, um, for lack of a better phrase, paradigm shifts about how we are you know, going to, to um, actually use the data going forward. We might need some, some work and some, uh, um, some efforts to um, make the board aware of what needs to be reconsidered. Sure. So I would say that most of our schools in our district are very meticulous about how we use discipline data and very in tune to where we are currently, probably much more so than any report that we send to the state. So as we find trends or um, both positive and negative things, we can certainly notify the board of those. Thank you. Mr. Send Walter. us the latest report that was done last, the latest report that we have. There. I'm sorry, could you Can you send us the latest report that we did the last time this, the state of data similar to this was generated? Like Yes, that would be at the end of the year last year, and we should be getting a report from the state soon. So uh, like Dr. Lauder said, sometime after Christmas, that will give us what happened last year and how we... So do we have something from... When was the last time you compiled that data? It was the end of the school year? End of the school year. Can, I see, can we see that again? Yes. Thanks. Okay, and that brings up one other issue that I see far too often. It's probably driven by the state. Will the data and the methodology of the data from last year be a different methodology um, in, in the data that we are accumulating for this year. And um, so we can see trends. If we can look back several 
periods um, will there be some uh, consistency in the data. What I'm trying to lead up to is how uh, sometimes data is calculated differently year over year and therefore you don't see a consistent um, uh, <coughs> use of, or it's hard to see a trend. So if we're looking at last year's and this upcoming year, can we pretty much see a apples to apples or a one to one uh, cross um, reference of, of each of the categories of data? Yes, yes. I, I think you see what I'm trying yes, to say. Yes, I at. do. Yes, we do have trend data and we'll continue with that trend data. This doesn't necessarily change how it's reported necessarily. Um, so I think the data we're going to have is going to be able to, to show you that. It's not, it's not drastically different. Any more comments from Ms. Ms. Reimer? Uh, board members, consent or action? Consent? Okay. Um, we'll put this on consent agenda. Could you make sure that uh, on the next week's board doc that the 90,000 is yeah. updated for us? And that would be perfect. All right, before we get move on to the next item, I'd like to recognize our SRO tonight, Brian Heinz from Northwest Middle School. Thank you for com thank you for coming in out and thank you for your service, Mr. Heinz. All right, folks, that moves us on to four point three, the approval of policy revisions, PLS updates on the second reading. And Ms. Reimer is here to talk about that. So we read those last time. They have been posted on our website uh, since the first of October. So we will take any questions and then I'll give you an update of where we are with our policies at this point. So if we got any <clears throat> any comments back? None. No comments. And all these are referenced to deal with that Iran Investment Act. Is there? Most of them, but there are a couple that do not. But most of them, yes. Okay. I still think that we should just go with the required, not the recommended. Any other comments? Mr. Harrison? Concerning um, 1760, 7280, um, when we make a change to a policy such as this, and this one is prohibition against retaliation, is it rolled out and communicated directly to staff or is it posted and that is it? Um, my, my question is, and having had recent conversations with people about a variety of things, um, are staff aware of this policy? And are they kept aware of it as it might change or be tweaked over time? Um, I, my, my question is merely, are staff aware that this and other policies like it exist? And are they continually made familiar uh, Refamiliarized with the existence of this type of policy. I'd be happy to have, be happy to have some offline discussions. Uh, with policy or through personnel. Because this becomes effective once it's approved, is that correct? It becomes effective once it's approved next week. So then, yeah, I think we need it. Right, but there's substantial change to it. I would just feel very good if staff were continually made and reminded that such a policy does exist. Thank you. Other comments? So we put this on the action agenda for next week. Can you group them all together? Though? We could we could break it apart and put a certain number on consent if we want to do I'm, that. I'm okay with that. Which ones would you all? Which ones do you suggest on the consent? Basically, I hear the um, Mr. Walter. Starting with 6420, I believe, is where we start with the uh, the Iranian Divestiture Act. That'd be fine. And then move down from that list on the summary 
page that I'm looking at. I'm looking at the very first uh, document that she had, which was the sum page, and there was a yellow blo block, mm -hmm. and everything below would be 6420 through Correct. 8210. So you would put that and on the action. Through 94. All the way through 94. Through 94, okay. <coughs> 9,400, yes, okay. Sir. Do you want that on the action or? Um, if we're voting on it, in, in, yeah, I would like it. I don't think we need to vote on them individually, but uh, if you can put them as a group. That'd okay, be, that'd be. so we'll put those on the action agenda. The ones above the yellow block, which includes um, 1760 through 1760-7280, 4333, uh, 5027, Slash 7275 weapons and explosives. All of those, can we put those on the consent agenda? As long as they've been put on the website and we haven't had any comments, I'm comfortable with that. All right, so we'll put the first three blocks noted on this um, uh, update, PLS update on the second read. Put that on the uh, consent agenda, and the, everything associated with the Iran Divestment Act is on our action. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Reimer. All right, that moves us to 5.1, the merit bonus recommendation. Ms. Klutz and Ms. Jones are coming up to the podium or to the chairs. So during the budget session this year, uh, funds were allocated uh, for um, merit bonus pay, and the Board of Education, each LEA, is de to determine their own plan, um, and we would like to present um, the recommended plan to the Board tonight. Um, I'll be reviewing the financial information, and Ms. Jones will speak to uh, anything related to evaluation and HR. So if you will go to the second page, please. So we started our um, adventure and selected a committee um, to help us decide or re make a recommendation to you for this merit. Um, we did a subcommittee of the budget committee um, and listed on the screen are the folks that contributed to our meetings. Um, we also wanted to be sure that we've got the, um, the areas that were most impacted um, by this merit bonus. So <coughs> departments like transportation and child nutrition were important just because of the sheer numbers that were involved. Okay. So merit pay is, is an approach to compensation that rewards the higher performing employees with, with additional pay or incentive pay. It has advantages and disadvantages for the employees and the employer. But all in all, uh, merit pay is the best way to reward employees that go above and beyond. Merit pay sends a powerful message about what you want to recognize and reward an employee's efforts and contributions. This is the guidance that was received from DPI. Um, I'll skip down to the bottom where it says legislative restrictions. Um, we, should, we shall adhere, adhere to the following. Um, it requires the local board to adopt a plan um, on how to award, and it's a little bit small for me to see, so I'm going to look at my, my, my uh, hard copy. Um, it, this, the bonus shall not be a across the board bonus because if it's across the board, it's not merit. Um, only state funded personnel are eligible for the bonus from state funds. Um, we ask the local um, and the other funds to participate too and, and got that consensus. Um, bonus is not subject to retirement, and it is a one-time payment, non-recurring. Okay. One more, please, Michael. Okay. Um, before you is the list, of, according to the state, of the eligible employees. Um, the funds were sent down by category, and these are the categories of staff that are included. 
um, you'll note that you do not see teachers or certified instructional staff in, in any way. This, the funding was um, indicated for um, folks other than our teaching staff and our instructional staff. Okay, next. All right, and I'm going to speak just to um, the criteria outside of the categories that will receive it. Uh, we looked at evaluation um, as part of the criteria. So for the summative evaluation for the end of 2015-16, they must be proficient or above on each standard. And uh, for present performance from July 1, 2015, through the time that we actually pay the bonus, there cannot be any discipline letters, memos, or uh, action plans on file for those individuals. If you look at the next slide, it is the actual matrix that each of the supervisors will complete. And basically it says exactly what I just said. If you look at the column up where the criteria it says at and above standard and just follow it straight down, they must not only be proficient, but the performance piece has to indicate that there are no disciplinary actions on file. And then those individuals be eligible. Um, you know, based on some additional criteria here. And then the below standard would be if they had anything disciplinary or uh, a below standard on their summative evaluation. The next piece of that is um, kind of a combination here of both of us from the standpoint of they must be employed by Cabarrus County Schools when the bonus is paid, and that's going to be paid on December 27th, so they still have to be an employee. The compensation bonus does not apply to anyone that's been separated from state service. So if they retired um, at the end of this month, then they're not going to be eligible for it, or if they retired during the summer. The um, retirement, we, we just said that, it's considered a separation from service, get ahead of myself, and does not imply to, apply to employees that were hired after um, January 5th of 2016, because that would have made them somewhat of a temporary employee because of the, the time period of being six months or less. And then we've already talked about the disciplinary actions and then the employment status, and that's just a repeat on that. So the question I get most often is how much is it? Um, so the, the bonus would be $500 for a full-time permanent eligible employee. Um, so if they met all the criteria that we just talked about, they would receive $500. Um, remember that prorated employees would, who work between 20 and 39 hours per week, employees who work 20 to 39 hours per week would receive a prorated amount of bonus. Um, employees who receive who work less than 20 hours per week are not eligible by state definition. Okay, and in order to um, and so the I think the board needs get, to get credit for this. The state allocated um, a a partial amount of the funds, and so the board to make it a higher amount. And so the the state allocated about 300 and some dollars per person. It depends on who's eligible. So anywhere from 361 to 382 per person. And the board um, has, uh, will, if you approve this plan, will allocate fund balance to cover the difference between what the state allocated and up to $500. So that's uh, certainly uh, something wonderful that the board's done. Um, we would like to take this fund, the, the funds from fund balance um, of our fund eight, and as you know, we've had lots of discussion about fund eight and, and where those funds come from. Um, that would be the recommendation to the board. And so this was just kind of a timeline to let you know um, the process that was used. We started um, the budget was passed in um, in the summer. Uh, then we received some guidance regarding the bonuses in September from DPI. We gathered our groups. Uh, we met in our committees. We got feedback from, from principals and groups. Um, we brought the, um, the recommendation to you tonight for uh, review. We would like for you to approve it on Monday the 14th. Um, we'll uh, communicate and work with principals on who's, who is eligible and who is not based on their evaluation data. Um, on Thursday the 17th, um, and then we would like to pay the bonus on December 27th. 
Um, the, the date is uh, related to all the tax implications that are associated with, with paying. Um, so we think that December 27th will minimize the tax impacts for that. Okay. Principals will accumulate the data from their school level employees. HR will accumulate data for principals and department directors um, will have to pull the data for their folks. And so at the end of the day, um, the message that we deliver to our employees is really important. Um, again, I'll just restate, merit is the best way to reward employees that go above and beyond. Merit sends a powerful message about what you want to recognize and reward an employee's efforts and contributions. Okay, and we'll take our, any questions that you have. All right, are there any comments or questions on this? Dr. Phillips? So do you know yet how many um, employees will be eligible and then what will be the total amount um, that will be paid out? I do not know how many people will be eligible, but I, you know, we can kind of guess. Um, so we had, um, if, we, if we have 1,568 staff members who qualify, um, then 175,000 will be, need to be allocated from fund balance. If 1,481 qualify, because we, we really don't know until we get the data from the principals, um, then only 140,000 would need to be allocated uh, from fund balance. So it just depends. But somewhere around 1,500 people is what we're expecting. All right, any other questions? And Ms. Carpenter? You, you feel comfortable with this. I know that in the past we've had to it, with our TAs and teachers, and we, we did have to, do, you know, go into our fund balance, but you feel comfortable with with this amount. And since it is a one-time amount, it's not a reoccurring, you know, expense, we would only be doing this one time. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I do feel comfortable, and, and yes, the fact that it's one time is a, is a huge reason that I feel comfortable doing that. Um, and we have recently received our audit report um, in the last couple of months and so that you know that ended favorably so yes I'm comfortable allocating that amount and one thing for our, our viewing audience uh, and some people may know they say well what about our teachers and and we did do a good thing for our teachers and we always want to remember our teachers but last year we did do increases for our, our supplements and our teachers' salaries last year, 4.7%, 5% on the supplements, where we didn't do as much for our non-certified, I think like 1.5 or things. So, uh, And we appreciate everyone, especially our teachers. So we want to make sure that we are doing this. And, and to the state, they... They helped us out with that, and our, and our county commissioners helped us out. Uh, so, but, but we do always remember our teachers, and so we're not forgetting anybody. So uh, we want to make sure everybody realizes that. And two, with the teachers, this did go into their actual their retirement which Thank makes you. it even more important. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think that's an important factor to remember. I just want to say one thing as a reminder here to make sure is that the state didn't permit us to, the way the legislation written, the state doesn't permit anything to go towards teachers. Right. So um, there is no possibility. So it's not a local decision. This school board is not deciding, you know, how that works. At the end of the day, they are not eligible. So what the, what we had to devise was a plan that did not involve teachers. So yes, we appreciate teachers, and we certainly want to emphasize that. But at the end of the day, it's not an option. Uh, it, we had to come up with a plan for people other than teachers. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Thank you, Dr. Louder. Uh, Mr. Harrison? And this is a great and well-deserved pat on the back to all of these staff members list, listed on one of those slides here. Um, <laughs> did I miss something, um, or, or can you repeat for me, please? The state has provided to Cabarrus County 376, mm -hmm. 725. Mm -hmm. How much is local and what range is fund balance, please? Could you repeat sure. those figures, in, unless I just misunderstood, please? Okay. Um, the state did provide 376,000 XXX dollars for us to allocate. 
Um, so it depends on how many folks are eligible um, is how far the state funds will go. If fewer people are eligible, the state funds go further. If more people are eligible, they go, it, you have to take more from fund balance. So it's just a kind of a shifting. I'll read the numbers again. So if 1,568 staff members qualify, 175,000 will need to be allocated from fund balance. If 1,481 staff members qualify, 140,000 will be, need to be allocated from fund balance. It'll be within those numbers somewhere. And then in addition to the 376 would be the total package of funding well, divvied up accordingly. Well, we'll also have child nutrition funds that are involved and mm -hmm. Kids Plus funds and federal funds. So it's, it's going to be a little more than those two numbers because they're coming out of different funds. The, the point is that they're <laughs> obviously getting a, a good bonus, yes. um, and that's, that's great yes. news for all of our staff. Thank yes. you for working out those, those meticulous details. Mr. Walter? Well, I think it's wonderful that the state has given us money to allocate towards the teachers. I'm just still struggling with the issue of digging into fund balance for, for it. Um, they've given us an amount of money to use, uh, 300 and something, or $382 to $361. That's, when it is a bonus, it's a pretty good bonus. Um, and we just talked about you know, our Trago award and how we go through if I have $175 and want to spend out of fund balance, why don't we see what 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 we can do with that money instead of just make it make a decision to put it that way? Um, I'll make a comment. What better place to spend your money on than employees? Well, and which is wonderful, but it's also and just to to explain how how do we impact kids the most? Like we were talking about earlier, we're not adding teachers in the classrooms because we had to take out a fund fund balance, and that's another year before that balances out. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So we're adding more students to each classroom because we can't add teachers. So um, if you'll recall through our prioritization process for the last four or five years, staff salary increases are always the very top. So I'm not sure that we are going outside. I certainly our, don't, don't judge. I mean, our, our folks work hard and especially the ones that they're going above and beyond deserve, deserve to be rewarded for that. It's just the, the issue of, you know, if we're going to spend fund balance, let's at least see where we're, you know, go through a process before we make that, that call. All right. But as, as Kelly just mentioned, number one and two salaries were the one and two type thing before even adding teachers. That was the one and two type things on our budget. And that was the first and second thing. And as I mentioned earlier, the two points to make, as Dr. Louder mentioned, the state told us that was the only thing we could use it for. Number two was that when the budget time came around, our non-certified got the least amount. They got less than what our teachers got. And this is an opportunity for us to do something. And when you look at what the state had given us, by the time you took the amount when we average it out, it was 300 and something dollars. By the time you take the taxes out, you're probably looking at a lot less. And if we're going to give them some, let's give them something that makes it a little worthwhile. I'm especially happy that this goes to employees and staff members who are um, high performing or it, very high at the, the top end of the scale of the performance of their job category or classification I, because to me competition is good and for the high performing people at every job title or role to be recognized for their stellar performance is a great thing that uh, I'm, I'm I'm tickled pink that that this is going to be put in, into their pocket. I'm sorry it's a one time, but it's um, well deserved, at least this year. Are there other comments? Are we going to put this on the consent or action agenda? Consent agenda. All right. Can we go ahead and vote on it? Well, I'm ready to vote on well if, if there's a motion, then we can do whatever we want to do. 
I make a motion we go ahead and do it because I know there's a deadline that we need to go ahead and get it, and that way we can go ahead and roll it out. I make Second. a motion we go ahead and do it. Second. I don't think All Mr. Right, Powell is so here that a vote as well. Wait a minute. Ms. Carpenter made a motion that we accept the proposal as presented by Ms. Klotz and Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. And uh, Dr. Phillips seconded that motion. Any more discussion on this particular? I think, Mr. I think Mr. Powell would like to be here to vote on that as well. He should have been here. Okay. All right. He should have been here. We typically vote on. Uh, All right. So there is a motion. There's been a second to it. Uh, call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. And that motion is carried 6 0. And uh, we can move ahead with the schedule a week earlier. Thank you. Thank you. That carries us to Ms. Carpenter. I believe you have the floor for the Helping Hands program. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll make this as quickly as possible, because if not, Mr. Furr will throw something at me. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, what brought this all about, I had the opportunity to tour one of our schools thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hill, uh, Crystal Hill, and the, uh, well, the two, Dr. Louder arranged this, uh, but Dr. Hill and the principal at Harris Road uh, gave me a great tour of the school. And while I was there, I really noticed, and I've heard it over and over, how about how teachers are having to take so much money out of their pockets to to pay for supplies. And when we were going into the classroom, I noticed especially two classrooms. One of them happened to be a science classroom. And I noticed that the science teacher, he was doing a couple of experiments. And, and with the, these experiments, he was using paper, I mean, it wasn't cups, it was like the red cups and had straws and had to have a couple rolls of paper towels um, and he was had mixed up a, a bottle that he had used cabbage and vinegar and, uh, and then poured this into the cups and then also he had did an experiment where he had used four different types of light bulbs and was measuring the heat off there and I'm sure every bit of those supplies he had paid for himself out of his pocket. And the, the principal even mentioned, he says, every time you come in this classroom, this gentleman has always have all these experiments. And I'm sure all that money had come out of that teacher's pocket. Then we went into another classroom. And, and in this classroom, this teacher probably had 25, 30 students. And they were doing gathering where they had to provide, had to build shelter. They had to gather their food. And, uh, uh, they, and they were using popsicle sticks and paper and 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 clay and all these type thing again 25 30 students in there and this teacher probably could really have used a volunteer plus she had all these supplies and again I had and have been in a lot of classrooms where the teachers are doing supplies well this program will help teachers with the cost of the supplies uh, many are paying out of their own pockets this program could also give them a helping hand by volunteering if they needed it for a special project. Uh, the points of the program would be to get the name of the teacher, the school, and the phone number. I've checked with Ms. Jones, and she said that we could get this information. And what I wanted to do is each week, all board members would pick a name out, you know, out of a hat or, you know, out of a container, and they would call the teacher, and they would ask what supplies they would need. Uh, you could pick more than one name if you wanted that week, um, and uh, you may put a limit on how much you wanted to pay for supplies. You could put $20, $25 on the supplies. Then you would deliver it to the school. Now, I know that I know that Mr. Powell isn't here, but I know he's always talking how he wants to go to the schools. This would give him an opportunity to go into the schools. Uh, if you wanted to do more than four a month, that's fine. You could pick as many as you want to. Now, if so, I know a lot of you work, and if you can't go deliver yours, I'll be more than happy to deliver them for you. Uh, that would 
could eliminate that problem. Um, and we could even open it up to businesses and other staff members if you wanted to you know, open it up for businesses. They could give money or, and, or they could pick names you know, for themselves and they could deliver it to schools. This way we could meet, reach more more teachers. Uh, this program could help teachers with the cost of the supplies. And one thing I wanted to mention, since 2008, our supply budget has been cut anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. Correct, Ms. Klutz? She can vouch for that. Now, I know that some of you, I know that some board members, they already donate their their whole paycheck towards back towards this. And then also I know that some companies already support some of our new teachers by giving supplies. And I know some of us board members, I know when I go to school, sometimes I may drop off a, a ream of paper or things. But I just think this would be an added thing to help uh, board members visit different schools. Also, volunteering if the teacher needs volunteers for special projects. But I think it helps us get into different schools and, and would help us really help our teachers. You may have other suggestions that you want on this program. One thing I do want to make uh, you aware of, my calculator must have had some numbers in it, but my numbers were wrong that I gave you the first time, uh, and I really apologize for that uh, when I was adding. Uh, we would be, it would be different numbers than I gave you on the sheet. Uh, if we did them one in it, they were really off bad, uh, but when I was typing this up, unfortunately, I was wearing gloves because I have been ill and so I, my fingers were not working real well. But if we did it one time a month just for the board, now this is the board only, we would be serving about 315 students if we did it twice a month, uh, that's per student, I mean per board member, we would be serving about 630 students. But still that's more than what we're doing now. So I think it still is a win-win in in my opinion, it's a win-win for all, for the teachers, for the system, and for the students and the citizens. Again, I'll take suggestions, but I think it's something we should look at, and I think it would be great for the teachers. Now, y'all can throw things at me now. I, I think I did pretty good. Uh, so comments or suggestions? All right. Uh, now open the floor up. Uh, are there any comments from Ms. Carpenter? Dr. Phillips? Well, I, I think it's a great idea, um, Ms. Carpenter. Thank you for, for bringing it up. The only suggestion I would add is that a number of our teachers use the Donors Choose program to try to raise small amounts of money for their classrooms. I know there's one teacher that's looking for money to buy science kits for her classroom. Um, and so that would be another option as well, is that we could choose one of the projects from Donors Choose. And, um, Frequently, donors choose uh, will double the amount that, that you give if you do it early in the, the fundraising campaign. So that, I would just add that as, a, as another option. Is that uh, located on the website? Um, donors choose, or is that something you just Google? And, uh, that's something you just, yeah, I think it's. Okay. Yeah. And I would be more than happy to go by the chamber and, and tell them about this myself, too, to say, hey, if you've got businesses, I mean, I'll, I'll do all the legwork we need to do because I know our teachers need all the help they can get because I, I've, I've seen it firsthand so many times. And like say, if, if you guys want to pick a name and if you need me to take it or you want to take I'll do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Anyone? I love Mr. your heart for, the, heart for teachers and looking for ways to improve and, and give them the resources. Um, there are other, other options. I know you were talking about the community and getting the community involved. I know there are community, out, community, community programs out there, such as Adopted Teacher, that we participate with. My, my family does. Um, adopts a certain, te certain teacher and goes with them the whole year and tries to provide them for, with the same type, of, same type of thing. I know our uh, Education Foundation has many grants for, for teachers that that really provide quite a bit to let let them do program projects and programs that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do as well. So we'd like to promote those to the community as well. I seem to remember that there was a opportunity to help supply help 
donate to supplies for students earlier in our board tenure the first in the first four years we had I thought there was a program that Cabarrus County Schools allowed anyone who wanted to donate money to help is there is there is there not something out there because I thought I remembered no we don't have something where people can donate to the schools Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, board members, do you, uh, Mr. Harrison? Uh, uh, just that uh, I want to commend uh, Ms. Carpenter for the idea. Um, anything that gets the exactly correct and the right supplies into the teacher's hands that they need to conduct that class would be a great thing. And if they, one, one method or another is used by which the teachers identify those items, um, then we just find a means or a way to make it happen or, or a financial mechanism to make it happen so that they get those supplies. Uh, it, it would be a great thing um, as opposed to having hundreds of glue sticks, you know, that which is a great intention but doesn't get the right uh, uh, amounts of supplies or, or types of supplies in, into people's hands. So if the teachers can identify the, the need that they have, it, 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 it'll, it'll work obviously best, and you know that from your experience. Thanks very much for a great idea. Board members, do you need anything else from Ms. Carpenter or to go on to make this actionable? Uh, well, we can put it on the consent agenda for next week, but uh, I want to kind of hear your preferences. No, I think it's a good idea, but I, I don't know how teachers going to feel about school board members calling them. I mean, is there is there a certain a different way we could do it? You know, to, to get the message to them, or or them to get the message to us instead of us calling a school teacher. I don't have much to add there. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't have a. <laughs> well, we can work on these details well, well, and the delivery of of a, of a good perhaps, intention. We can work on the details and the method of making this happen. Perhaps um, we can ask Ms. Jones to provide us some assistance in finding in, in giving us teachers. Maybe maybe it's the principals or something. But okay. Board members, do you want to put this on the action agenda for next week so we can discuss this a little bit more? Ms. Ms. Roberts oh. had a good idea that you could have teachers fill out what they wanted, and y'all could draw that out or something, and then you could deliver it to them. That's a, that's a great idea. Right. And something right. fairly simple could be put on the website or the personnel page of the website right. where teachers do that, yeah. and then that accumulates their exact requests and their yeah, needs. Just do a helping hand form, maybe. Do a form. And then they fill out the form. Yeah. We can do a survey. We can ask for an electronic survey if you want staff in. We can do an electronic survey. You all decide what it is you want, and you send that out and, and get that information. And they can supply whatever contact information that they want, along with any supplies. And I think that you know, I've talked, and my concern was that the um, equality. somebody does, I know you put a limit in there, Ms. Carpenter, so if you all decide on limits, because then that could work morale as well if, you know, I'm the teacher next door and I just got $10 worth of supplies and you got $25 worth of supplies. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to make sure if we set a limit that we did have a limit, because I wouldn't want somebody, to, like you say, get $10. with the bonus and make it unified so everybody got the same thing. So if we could do it that way, that'd be All right. Great. So do we want to put this on the action agenda? And um, do you want to work with Ms. Reimer and Ms. Jones on just a little bit more detail so that we can uh, have a, a good motion next week? Yeah. All right. That sounds great. All right. So
All right. That carries us to. We need a motion to convene in closed session. Um, convene in closed session to, according to General Statute 143.318.11a3, to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public. Uh, therefore, I need a motion to convene in closed session. Is there such a motion? David Harrison makes the motion. Tim first seconds it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay. We are now in closed session. <laughs>